So, yes, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm talking about Ableton styles, and as the name suggests, I'm talking about also the company Ableton, which is a Berlin company, and we are making music software, and since 2013 also hardware. Our main products are live, maybe you've heard of that. It's a digital audio workstation, uh, quite complex, now 15 years old, and uh, still rocking, and Push is fairly new. It's a pad-based controller. Um, both are conceptually musical instruments, so you make music with them as if you play a violin or electric guitar. That means we have really complex and rich interaction patterns. It's, uh, it's not normal mouse down, mouse up. It's really complicated things, multi-touch control. Um, um, if, if we would have multi-touch control, we would use that. Um, and this means also that our design and uh, the usability is really crucial. So now we are investigating a little bit in QT and QML, and we have to figure, we have to find, uh, we have to design, we have to design around these detailed things. One of the stuff is we are talking about, if we talk about reusable and adaptable components, we have three really stupid e examples here. They are not from our live code base, they are not in our software, they are really only chosen for an example. We have a base control, um, which is actually a volume meter, and if this appears somewhere in the software in a dark, content, dark context, it should probably look like the above one. If it appears in the light context, it looks in the middle one, which means you have to change somehow the layout of this one. If you have a theming system, that's obvious, um, but if you take a look in the th third one, it's even changing its layout, so there is not so much space, so you have to leave out icons. And if you have all of that in the same application, you have to find out the way how to style your, your, your base controls. Of course, there are ways how to do that. So one common approach which you find in the net also is um, a theme singleton. So you de define a singleton instance, you find all the properties on it, maybe in a hierarchical fashion, then you bind these theme singleton properties into your real base, uh, into your real production code, what you see below. Uh, if, you inst if your application is simple, that's, uh, or small, that's no problem. If it gets bigger and more complex, even your themes objects get bigger and more complex, and at some point the themes thing is as unmaintainable as your real complex code, and you would like to avoid that. There's another point in that, we saw that today already, that if you use uh, really loadable code, uh, reusable components, why not defining it as a style? So we have these button styles from the Qt Quick Controls. They are all defined and they are used for styling applications or controls to look like on a Mac or on Windows. In this case, in these examples, we are not using either the one or the other. We want to use our own style. And if you want to use this component for different applications, like an embedded view, like an application view in different things, you have to use for every usable control and control your own style. And you can predefine them, and the number of these styles grows um, as you can expect. So you have three different applications, three different uh, embedded views. It's always the same complex behavior and the styles grow and grow and grow. Or you mess up your code with all these styling information in place, which you try to avoid, of course. There's a different approach, which we have in the Qt widgets, which are style, she style sheets. And these style sheets are unluckily not available in QML yet, or probably they will never get there. And this is what we try to achieve we made our own style sheets in, uh, in QML. And how we do it is QML components are organized in a hierarchy. If you have this component hierarchy, they have type names. And what we can do is we can match CSS-like selectors on this hierarchy. Um, we implement the full, full program, what we need, cascading, inheritance, specificity rules. Some of the really complicated specificity rules in real CSS we left out because we don't have inline style specifications and all that stuff, but uh, it would be easy to implement. And since we implemented it as an ordinary QML extension plugin, we only use public APIs. You can simply use this and plug it in every QML application you want, given that you prepare your application, your QML code, to use it. And this is how it would look like. Let's take the view on the left side. This is some uh, arbitrary um, component hierarchy. 
it resembles somehow the example volume control I showed you before. So you have an outer item, a control bar, which contains a volume control. Um, maybe there's another volume control on some other level. And now if you want to put uh, CSS properties to this, your CSS file would look probably like the, the right side. So you have a volume control, which takes a color. And on the other side, you want to give these volume buttons are visible only for those volume controls inside of the control bar. So you have inheritance um, and cascading. So how does this work in QML for real? We have to annotate our QML components. Since QML does not use CSS natively, we use attached properties and basically say, give me the color property from the style set bound to this control bar component. This looks it up from the background, binds it, makes a property binding. So whenever the style sheet is changing, the property of our control bar is changing. So you as a QML developer put all these properties everywhere where you think it's uh, useful, you annotate your code, and you are ready to ship it. You ship your CSS file, and fine. One thing is missing. Of course, you can use CSS class names, again, as an attached property. So you can de uh, de de distinguish between a big control bar and a small control bar. That's all CSS basics. You can use, of course, multiple class names, so even property mix-ins are possible, and you can do really crazy stuff with that. One thing is missing, of course, you have to set up a style engine. You do this once on your top level. It, in this case, it's an application window. You define where the style path is, where all these CSS files lie, and what your initial style name is. This is a file name. Uh, the style engine is watching on that, so whenever it's changing, it's reloading. Currently, it does it always. Um, maybe we change it only for debug mode. For debugging, it's definitely very powerful. Of course, it's a property binding again. You can use whatever function you like to get these style name from. So make some, some UI control for the user to change the style name file and you have loadable themes out of the box. So if you did this, of course, you don't have to stop with CSS. Since it's standard CSS, you can use whatever CSS preprocessor you want to have. Use SAS, use less, whatever you, you want to have. And then you can compile really crazy CSS files, playing with functions in the CSS mode. And um, you can give this to your designer and say, please change this SAS file to whatever you like and your QML engine will adapt automatically to this, which gives you a nice uh, workflow. So basically, you have to suddenly change your QML application when the designer says, but I want to have this button in that specific color, because you can tell it, design it in your SAS file, and you are done. And this is basically what it is. If you have any questions, I'm around here. Tomorrow also, you can address me. The code is not yet available, but we will open source it in the near future. Um, look out for that Twitter address. This is not yet online too, but it will become hopefully online in the next few days. Thank you very much. <laughs>